The Malvern Hills rise up dramatically from the Severn Vale and provide a distinctive landmark for miles around. Understandably, they attract visitors from far and wide, whether to stroll along their spectacular ridge and enjoy the breathtaking views, or to indulge in more extreme activities. Since man first set foot in these parts, they've made use, in one way or another, of the Malverns. To delve into the origins of the hills themselves, though, takes us back to before the time of man. A long, long time before. Their story starts an incredible 600 million years ago when the fiery ball of molten minerals that was once planet Earth began to cool. They formed into the ancient igneous rocks, the hard granites and diorites that make up the Malverns. These are the oldest hills in England. Granite is made up of three minerals that show up in different coloured veins and are exposed in disused stone workings, like gullet quarry. The light streaks are quartz, the darker ones mica, and the pink or orange bands feldspar. Diorite makes up the striking outcrop of ivy scar rock on North Hill and contains darker minerals like iron and magnesium. This is slightly younger than granite, and the flowing appearance of the outcrop suggests that it was the result of a volcanic eruption that forced molten lava to the surface. So, the basic building blocks of the Malverns had been forged. What came next? was one of the most extraordinary events to shape the face of our planet. The Earth's surface is made up of continental plates floating on a semi-molten layer. Occasionally, these plates collide with awesome consequences. Along the main line of impact, rocks are buckled and folded to form mighty mountain ranges and the shock waves spread out for hundreds of miles, transforming the landscape. Following one such collision, a series of violent earthquakes forced the Malverns up into the dramatic north-south ridge that rises to nearly 1,400 feet 
at its highest point on Worcestershire Beacon. Further powerful upheavals caused fractures across the ridge, forming the individual peaks and creating natural passes through the hills. The contrasting landscapes on either side of the Malvern Hills have their own story to tell. By about 450 million years ago, a warm tropical sea covered what is now Herefordshire and lapped at the western side of the Malvern Ridge. It was teeming with life and over time the shells and skeletons of billions upon billions of tiny creatures built up into a layer of limestone on the ocean floor. At times when the sea was shallower it deposited a layer of mud which was compressed into shale and the occasional layer of sandstone. When sea levels rose again another layer of limestone formed. Then, more underground activity forced these bands of rock up at an angle. Shale is softer than limestone and erodes more quickly, leaving the limestone hills you can see now, standing above fertile shale lowlands. To the east of the Malvern Ridge, the lie of the land is completely different. The Severn Plain, stretching out to the Cotswolds, is made up of flatbeds of soft red sandstone, deposited in desert conditions about 175 million years ago. So, from the top of these ancient hills, you can look over 600 million years of our planet's amazing natural history. In relative terms, man's contribution to the story of the Malvins is but a blink of the eye, but it's a fascinating contribution nevertheless. This saucer-shaped depression on top of Pinnacle Hill is the remains of a Bronze Age burial chamber dating from around 1000 BC, evidence of early settlement of the region. This was probably where the cremated remains of a tribal chieftain were interred. By about 700 BC, Britain had been overrun by Celtic tribes from the continent, and the Malvins were part of the kingdom of a tribe known as the Siluris. On the other side of the Severn Plain, was the territory of a rival tribe known as the Dubunai. The Celts were a warlike people and to defend their kingdom from hostile neighbours, the Siluris created three hill forts in the Malvins, the most impressive of which was on Herefordshire Beacon. The incredibly well-preserved ramparts of British camp are the result of years of toil, carving out the ditches from the solid rock beneath. It's estimated that a community of up to 2,000 people could have lived within these formidable defences, making British camp a major settlement in Iron Age Britain. It was the Celtic people who lived here that gave the hills their name. They called them Moyle Fryn, meaning Bear Hills, an entirely apt description. The people of Iron Age Malvern were also the first to leave behind evidence of use of the witch cutting as a thoroughfare. A thriving salt trade centered on Droitwich, or witch as it was once known. This ancient route through the Malvern Hills was used to transport salt into South Wales from which, hence its name. When the road was improved in 1840, 
A hoard of more than 250 Iron Age currency bars were uncovered. Roman occupation of Britain seems to have had little impact on the Malvern area, although they almost certainly continued to transport salt via the witch cutting from Droitwich to their stronghold at Monmouth. The legions were withdrawn from Britain early in the 5th century, and Anglo-Saxon tribes were quick to take advantage of its weakened state. The invaders pushed the British further and further west, and in 577 won a decisive battle at Durham, on the edge of the Cotswolds. This gave the Saxons control of the three major strongholds of Bath, Cirencester and Gloucester, and saw the British fleeing across the Severn. For a time, the hill forts of the Malverns held out against the Anglo-Saxon onslaught, but eventually they also fell. The British were forced back across the Wye, which for centuries formed the boundary between Saxon England and Celtic Wales. Unlike the Cotswolds, which is a Saxon name, the Malverns retained their Celtic title. Although the newcomers did leave, a linguistic mark on the area. The link in Malvern link comes from the Saxon word hlink, meaning rising ground. The area around the Malvern Hills was densely forested and largely unpopulated. But in the late 9th century, the first steps towards settlement were taken. It's said that Worston, a monk from Deerhurst near Tewkesbury, took refuge from a marauding Viking army in the woods around Malvern. He was hunted down and slaughtered, and later honoured as a saint. A century later, Aldwin, a monk from Worcester, established a hermitage on the site. Shortly after, at the urging of Walston, the Bishop of Worcester, Edward the Confessor gave land to found a monastery in what was described as the Wilds of Malvern. In 1066, before that could happen, Edward died, and in less than a year, England had fallen to the Normans. To keep the people of the surrounding area subdued, the Normans built a Mott and Bailey castle on the site of British camp. William the Conqueror confirmed the grant of Edward the Confessor and Gilbert, the new French abbot of Westminster, sent a party of monks to finally complete the foundation of Great Malvern Priory. The water supply for the monastery was one of the area's many springs. A small village inhabited by people dependent on the priory for their living grew up outside its walls. The fact that the priory was owned by Westminster Abbey but within the diocese of the Bishop of Worcester was a serious bone of contention. At one time, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the King, and even the Pope were dragged into the argument. Early in the 12th century, the Bishop of Worcester founded his own priory at Little Malvern. This was one of the smallest Benedictine priories in the country. William the Conqueror also enclosed 8,000 acres of woodland, scrub and marsh extending from the Malverns to the River Severn as a royal hunting forest where the king and his successors could enjoy exclusive hunting rights. In the late 13th century, Edward I gave the royal forest 
to the powerful Earl of Gloucester, Gilbert de Clare, the Red Earl, as he was known, from the colour of his hair. Having passed from royal ownership, the forest assumed a new status as Malvern Chase. De Clare claimed his new estates included the western slopes of the Malvern Hills, a claim disputed by the Bishop of Hereford. The Bishop appealed to the King, who ruled in his favour. In retaliation, De Clare constructed a ditch on his side of the boundary, which can still be made out alongside the hilltop ridge. The Red Earl's ditch was shaped in such a way that any of the bishop's deer could jump into it from the Herefordshire side, but couldn't climb back out. Meanwhile, Great Malvern Priory had grown extremely wealthy from grants by rich benefactors, and in the mid-15th century, the Priory Church was rebuilt in magnificent style. But disaster was looming. The Pope had refused Henry VIII's request to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The headstrong king declared himself above the Pope, established himself as head of the church in England and effectively granted his own divorce. He then set about abolishing all Catholic institutions with allegiance to Rome including England's monasteries and priories. In 1539, the monks of Great Malvern surrendered the priory to Henry VIII's commissioners. Its land and buildings were sold off and in many cases demolished and the stone used for other building projects. Happily, the priory church was saved by the people of Great Malvern, whose own parish church which stood on the site of the post office, was derelict. They petitioned the king, who agreed to sell it to them for £20, around 100000 in today's terms, a huge sum for the 102 households that made up the parish. They were allowed to pay in two instalments and had no money left over for repairs or improvements. But... Their impoverishment has left the magnificent Priory Church with a priceless legacy. Henry VIII's Reformation had seen large-scale destruction of medieval stained glass, which was seen as papist. The villagers here simply couldn't afford to replace the old windows, so that Great Malvern Parish Church contains one of the finest collections of medieval stained glass in the country. Another bit of the medieval priory to survive was the original gatehouse that guarded the main entrance. It now houses Malvern Museum. Little Malvern Priory and its estates were sold to Henry Russell for £413 on condition that the choir and tower of the Priory Church were retained for the use of the parish. Henry VIII's Protestant Reformation was consolidated during the reign of his daughter Elizabeth I, often with brutal persecution of Catholics. Her hardline stance made her enemies abroad, particularly in staunchly Catholic Spain. When the King of Spain sent his armada to regain England for the Catholics in 1588, the Malvins played their part in the country's early warning system. The beacon was lit on Worcestershire Beacon to warn of its approach, and it was said that Twelve fair counties saw the blaze from Malvern's lonely height. The Armada was repelled and England saved. Half a century later though, 
the country found itself in the grip of another conflict, this one internal. Friction between King Charles I and Parliament was rapidly dragging England into civil war. Although Malvern largely escaped the ravages of a war that raged in nearby Worcester, it did have an impact on the area's development. Forest law still applied to Malvern Chase, but King Charles needed cash to finance his struggle with Parliament. He released the chase from the forest laws in return for a third of it, which he immediately sold. Parts of the rest still exist as common land and give the built-up areas of Malvern a sense of space. The money raised by the king on his share of Malvern Chase proved nowhere near enough to secure victory and he eventually lost his crown and his head to Parliament. Another individual to turn to the Malverns in an attempt to make some money was a Bristol man who, in the early 18th century, invested £600 in a mining venture on the slopes of Worcestershire Beacon. It's long been claimed that the hills contain gold, but his 200 foot deep shaft offered up nothing of substantial value, and the talked of Malvern gold rush never materialised. Rather more lucrative and considerably easier to exploit was the water that gushed forth from dozens of springs around the Malverns. The special properties of Malvern water had long been recognised. The word holy, as in holy well, originates from the Anglo-Saxon word heilig, which meant health-giving, indicating that the Saxons were aware of its qualities. There are records in old books of Malvern monks wrapping the infirm in cloths steeped in well water and making them sleep with wet cloths on the diseased parts. It's thought that, as the Derbyshire wells are today, once a year, Holy Well was dressed and all who'd been cured returned to give thanks and make an offering to invoke the continuance of the miraculous powers of the well. Malvern water was first bottled and sold in the 17th century, the first in the country to be exploited commercially. By the 18th century, it was on sale on the streets of London for a shilling a bottle. In the 1740s, Dr John Wall, co-founder of the Worcester Royal Infirmary, carried out the first scientific test on Malvern spring water and made some surprising discoveries. Until then, it was widely believed that its curative properties lay in its high mineral content. In fact, Dr. Wall found that it was completely the opposite. Malvern water is extraordinarily pure. It has no colour, no smell and there is no deposit. The acid-alkaline balance is practically neutral. It contains no potentially harmful bacteria and, most surprising of all, virtually no dissolved minerals. But what makes Malvern water so special? The answer lies in the unique geology of the hills. The ancient granites and diorites are not dissolved by rainwater which percolates the rock through faults and fissures to emerge in the foothills of the ridge. Not only does the water not absorb any minerals, the rock actually removes many impurities so that the springs are crystal clear. Dr Wall published the results of his tests, claiming that the efficacy of Malvern water 
stems from its great purity. An 18th century wit wrote, The Malvern water, says Dr John Wall, is famed for containing just nothing at all. The area's reputation as a curative centre spread and Great Malvern and Malvern Wells began to expand with hotels and other facilities built to cater for the increased number of visitors. Dr Benjamin Stillingfleet wrote in July 1757 I've been in Malvern about 12 days where, with difficulty, I have secured a lodging the place being so very full. Nor do I wonder at it, there being some instances of very extraordinary cures in cases looked upon as desperate, even by Dr. Wall, the physician who brought the waters into vogue. Holywell was the most important of Malvern Springs and, at Dr Wall's urging, the outlet was contained in a suitable building to make taking the waters here a more comfortable experience. The other of Malvern's main springs was dedicated to St Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary and the patron saint of springs and wells who, it was said, would protect the flow and purity of the water forever. In 1815, a cottage was built over the well for the use of visitors. A guidebook of the day claimed that the female inhabitant is always particularly neat and clean and with great civility attends you with glasses to drink the water or assist you at the spout for the affected part to receive the healing element. From 1823, facilities in Great Malvern were improved and St Anne's began to eclipse Holy Well. Among the many visitors to the well were Dowager Queen Adelaide and, in 1831, Princess, later Queen Victoria. They arrived, like everyone else, on the back of a donkey. The donkeys were kept in wooden sheds at the top of St Anne's Road, where one of them still stands. In the 1840s, the status of Malvern as an upmarket spa took a major step forward when Dr Wilson returned from an information gathering visit to Grafenberg in Austria, where Dr Preisnitz had pioneered hydrotherapy cures. Wilson joined forces with Dr Gully to recreate Grafenberg in Malvern. They even brought over an authentic Austrian band to play at the wells. Dr Wilson opened the first water cure establishment in Great Malvern at the Crown Hotel, where Lloyd's Bank now stands. This was only the second of its kind in Britain. Here, with an intensive treatment that included no spiced food or alcohol, exercise and plenty of water taken inwardly and outwardly, Wilson treated his first patient, a local carter who suffered from severe gout. He made a miraculous recovery. Spurred on by this success, Dr Gully opened the Tudor Hotel. Here, men and women were separated because Gully maintained that mental distractions and irritations of business and of the passions interfered with the cure. The cure involved wrapping the patient in wet sheets at six o'clock in the morning. They were then bathed in cold water and sent to the hills to drink from the spring. Later, they were doused when 238 litres of cold spring water a minute fell six metres onto their naked bodies. Despite the severity of the treatment, Wilson and Gully 
was soon attracting people from all over Europe and as far afield as America. A young Theodore Roosevelt was treated here for typhoid. Another great boost came in 1861 when the railway was extended to Malvern. Great Malvern Station was built in grand style to impress wealthy visitors and nearby was one of the largest Great Western Railway hotels in the country. The Imperial, now Malvern Girls College, was one of the first to be lit by gas and was equipped with a variety of baths, including brine brought in by rail from Droitwich. Many more water cure establishments sprang up here, each with their own resident doctor, and boarding houses and hotels were built to cater for the huge number of people coming to Malvern to take the waters. Great Malvern now grew rapidly as a fashionable resort. The Winter Gardens were built in 1885 as a miniature crystal palace. Priory Park, once part of the monastic lands, was laid out with the old monk's fish pond as the centrepiece. Here, the wealthy promenaded to the accompaniment of brass bands. Many of the wealthy visitors to Malvern liked it so much they decided to settle here and a number of local landowners cashed in on the demand for upmarket homes. Malvern Link Common is surrounded by large Victorian houses with spacious gardens. Lady Emily Foley, who owned the land, required plots of at least an acre planted with trees. Pressure for new housing has seen the gaps in between filled in. The increase in population meant that roadside springs and spats were no longer adequate to meet demands for water. In 1895, British Camp Reservoir opened, fed by several natural springs. Here, water was stored and distributed throughout the Malvern area. This still acts as a backup for the main supply. By now, the massive growth in tourism and population were taking its toll on the Malvern Hills. The demand for housing had seen it start to creep up the hills themselves and the sheer volume of people tramping over them was causing serious damage. To protect them, in 1884, an Act of Parliament was passed, setting up a unique body known as the Malvern Hills Conservators. Their main duties were to preserve the natural aspect of the land to preserve the hills as open space for public enjoyment, to prevent building, enclosure or encroachment on the land and to protect commoners' rights. Meanwhile, Malvern was developing a tradition for music and the arts, thanks largely to Sir Edward Elder. He was born at Broadheath, a few miles away, and loved the area drawing inspiration from the magnificent hills and the countryside around. He attracted famous contemporaries like George Bernard Shaw and developed a festival famous for theatre and cinema as well as music. Algo was buried at Little Malvern and is suitably commemorated in Great Malvern. Furthermore, his legacy is still with us today. The concert club he founded in 1903 still stages high quality events and, thanks to Malvern's musical pedigree, the English String Symphony Orchestra have made it their home. While Edward Elgar was putting Malvern on the musical map, 
the region's water cure establishments were facing problems. In 1905, three deaths from typhoid caused by a block drain that contaminated the water supply of a hydropathic centre caused a scare. In addition, cheaper and faster travel meant that the affluent travelled abroad and the development of modern medicine meant that fewer people came to Malvern in search of the water cure. But another local business that would become world famous was in its infancy. Morgan, the only independent car maker in the world. This remarkable story began in 1906 when 25 year old H.F.S. Morgan opened a garage and motorworks in Malvern Link where he ran a successful bus service from Malvern Link to the Wells and later from Malvern to Gloucester. He also became district agent for Walsley and Darrock. Eventually he bought an Eagle Tandem, a three-wheeler fitted with an eight-horsepower water-cooled engine. His experiences with the tandem gave him the idea of making his own three-wheeler. He bought a seven-horsepower twin-cylinder Peugeot engine and mounted it into a light three-wheel tubular chassis. The first Morgan runabout had been born. It made its very first public appearance at the Olympia Motor Show in 1910. As it evolved further, HFS took his creation onto the racetrack. It was so fast that it was sometimes required to start a lap behind four-wheelers in the same class. In 1936, a four-wheeled Morgan was unveiled at the London and Paris exhibitions. The combination of an ash frame with aluminium panels provided durability with the lightness required for a sports car. It was an immediate success. Since those pioneering days, the company has achieved a unique balance that has made the name Morgan legendary among motor enthusiasts. While keeping pace with modern technology, the founding family have remained resolute in their independence quality of manufacture and originality of design. Today they provide handmade bespoke sports cars with traditional style but contemporary performance. While HFS Morgan was making a name for himself, the Malvern Hills conservators were struggling with a new problem. Ironically, caused by the increase in car ownership. Until now, quarrying had been on a small scale, but the demand for Malvern stone was growing because it made an ideal base for road building. Large companies were obtaining licenses to commercially exploit the hills for their ancient stone. The traditional appearance of the hills was in danger of being altered irreparably. After several unsuccessful attempts in 1924, the Conservators were granted an Act of Parliament which enabled them to buy up quarrying rights as long as landowners were compensated. This was an expensive process and it was another 50 years before quarrying finally came to an end with the closure of Gullet Quarry. The hills were saved and, with another twist of irony, some of the disused quarries have become attractions in their own right. Another impact of the motor car was recognised in 1930 when the conservators were given powers to provide car parks and to charge for parking, something unimagined when they were formed back in 1884.
Soon, the country as a whole began to face up to more unimagined horrors. As the threat of war grew, rural Worcestershire was chosen as the seat of government should Hitler launch a successful invasion. Malvern College was earmarked for the Admiralty and Schoolhouse would have become the office of Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note thinking that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Early in 1942, Fears of a commando raid caused the telecommunications research establishment with its 2,500 scientists to be moved from Swanage to the comparative security of Malvern. Their top secret mission under the control of Sir Bernard Lovell was to develop a new generation of radar technology that could be used on aircraft. It was codenamed H2S. By June, the program was sufficiently advanced enough to embark on a series of short trial flights from Defford Air Base. On the evening of June the 7th, 1942, news came through that many of the top scientists had perished in a Halifax bomber which crashed near Goodrich Castle. Also on board, was the only working H2S equipment. Lovell was convinced that this was the end of the project, but the Morven chiefs were summoned to Downing Street, where Churchill demanded that he have 200 of the H2S sets by October. Lovell was to be given access to all of the resources he needed. Despite the setback, the Morven research unit gave the Allies the systems that helped them to go on the offensive and ultimately win the war. Planes left Defford on major raids on Europe, equipped with the most advanced technology. The bombing war, strikes against U-boats and the D-Day invasion all depended on the centimetric radar developed in Malvern. Germany's Grand Admiral Dönitz later described it to Hitler as the most decisive technical breakthrough of the war. Another scientific unit in Malvern was the Radar Research Development Establishment, based at Pale Manor. They worked on the application of radar for use by the army, particularly to improve the accuracy of big guns. Nearby, at Earl's Croom, Army gun specialists tested the practical aspects of the research, and one of the experts, Major Ewanson, was on Montgomery's staff for the D-Day landings. Wow. 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 Malvern was also chosen as the site of one of Britain's largest training establishments. During the course of the war, 80,000 recruits were trained here. As the Gazette reported, there were more sailors walking around Malvern than most British seaports. There can be few towns, if any, of comparable size that made such a contribution to the war effort. There was also a huge foreign contingent here. After escaping from Dunkirk, the headquarters staff of the Belgian army were installed at the Abbey Hotel and there was a high-ranking contingent from the Polish Navy engaged on secret work. 
three French troops could be recognised wandering around the town in their navy berets and flowing capes. 500 Dutch soldiers and airmen, wounded American GIs and French Canadians, added to the cosmopolitan mix. Five US military hospitals, under the direction of Colonel Lehman, were set up in the Malvern area, and hospital trains became a regular sight at the Malvern stations. Some of the finest surgeons in America worked in the hospitals, and one boasted that in its two years of service, only six lives had been lost. Nearly all the sites had wonderful views of the Malvern Hills and patients and staff said what an ideal place Malvern was, both for its fresh air and scenery. The Americans established good relations with the local people and invited them to hospital parties. In return, the Malvern Civic Reception Committee organised parties at the Winter Gardens for staff and patients. A ball in 1945 provided the chance to say farewell to the GIs that had become a feature of Malvern life. Afterwards, in a letter to Malvern Council, Colonel Lehman paid tribute to this fertile valley which we have come to love in our frequent travels of the last 15 months. We've always considered ourselves most fortunate to have been stationed in such a beautiful spot. Our group will ever remember the many kindnesses of your people, your hospitalities and the continued efforts of all groups to make our stay here one of the most pleasant sojourns of our lives. Malvern now settled back into its more familiar, genteel existence although the Defence Research Agency stayed on. As a result, it probably boasts a greater proportion of highly qualified physicists in its population than anywhere else on Earth. At certain times of year, Malvern's population is boosted still further. In 1797, with a membership of just a hundred, the Three Counties Agricultural Society was established to promote agriculture, horticulture and food production in the Three Counties. From these humble origins, the Society now enjoys the respect of agriculturalists worldwide, boasts a membership of 6,000 and has its permanent showground home on Blackmoor Park Road. The showground hosts a national sheep show, arena concerts, dog shows, numerous fairs and rallies, and of course, its flagship event, the Three Counties Show, that attracts more than 100,000 people, temporarily doubling Malvern's population. Meanwhile, the battle to protect the Malvern Hills goes on. The 29 Conservators are volunteers, either elected in local wards or appointed by one of the local councils. They employ staff and volunteers who carry out the day-to-day -day work to ensure the duties of the conservators are fulfilled. One of the biggest problems they face today is the bracken and gorse that is gradually creeping up the hill. In earlier centuries, many householders took up their grazing rights and sheep were prolific on the hillsides, munching away and keeping them bare. Now, few people who live in Malvern have a need or interest in keeping livestock. Less grazing means more scrub, which leads to more trees. If this is left unchecked, the distinctive profile of the hills and the panoramic views from the top will be gone and the freedom to roam seriously restricted. The Conservators have drawn up a new management plan that includes clearing scrub from open grassland 
and encouraging more grazing. It also includes a programme to make the public more aware of things like the threat of traffic and uncontrolled dogs to livestock. Responsibility for the preservation of this unique landscape rests with us all. We can all do our bit to ensure that the traditional aspect of these ancient hills survives for future generations to enjoy. Thank you.